Mazda's most significant compact SUV is this car, the CX-30. It borrows its engineering from the Mazda 3 hatch, but clothes it with the trendier SUV body styling that family buyers now increasingly want. Highlights here include eye-catching looks, cutting-edge engines, and one of the best cabins in the segment. If you're shopping in this sector, you probably weren't considering this Mazda, but you probably should be. Mazda needed a wider SUV range, and this compact CX-30 model broadens it usefully. Let's take a look. The brand has been present in the volume part of the crossover class since the popular CX-5 model was launched back in 2012. That car was joined a few years after by the smaller Mazda 2 Supermini derived CX-3 SUV, which in first generation form sold for four years from 2015. The CX-5 evolved into a sleeker second generation model in 2018, and by the time its smaller CX-3 stablemate ceased production in 2019, it had been moved subtly up market. Now that created a gap in the range that this CX-30 slides neatly into. It's a touch bigger than the old CX-3 was and a touch trendier too. And that's important given the fashion conscious clientele being targeted here. People shopping in the Qashqai class who can't quite stretch to a premium brand, but who nonetheless want something a little more eye-catching. Other mainstream makers have been targeting this profitable little niche, and that's why rivals like Volkswagen's T-Roc, uh, Ford's Puma, and Toyota's CHR are so much in vogue at present. As with those cars, the CX-30 in its plusher forms also has aspirations to steal sales from similarly sized SUV models with more premium badges. So contenders like BMW's X1, the Mercedes GLA, and the Lexus UX. Now, if you're wondering, as we initially did, why this car isn't called the CX-4, it's because that badge already adorns quite a different Mazda model in the Chinese market. Plus, the number four is considered unlucky in Japan, as it sounds like death. So, glad we got that cleared up. Anyway, it all explains the need for the rather contrived CX-30 moniker. But there's nothing contrived about the engineering that underpins this car. For a start, it's much more than just a Mazda 3 on stilts. Uh, the SUV styling changes have been accompanied by reductions in wheelbase and body length to help with greater urban manoeuvrability. Then there's the engineering, based around a couple of 2.0-litre Skyactiv petrol engines inevitably borrowed from the Mazda 3. Now, they both feature mild hybrid assistance. Uh, the more powerful supercharged Skyactiv X variant uses spark-controlled compression ignition to deliver a petrol response allied to diesel economy. If you also add into the mix what might just be the nicest interior in the segment, standard equipment features that you'd absolutely have to pay extra for on rivals and class leading safety provision you have a really promising sounding package so time to put it to the test Now, it wasn't so long ago that we advised you to abandon all hope of driving enjoyment if you came in search of a compact SUV. Uh, this CX-30 sets out to prove that it doesn't have to be that way. And it starts off with a huge advantage uh, because it's based on what, in our view, is currently the best handling family hatch in the segment, the Mazda 3. You get a feel for what's been achieved here pretty much immediately you drive the thing. Does any small SUV have a better manual gear shift than this? Well, not in our experience. Honda's HRV gets closest. Otherwise, changing gear in a typical compact crossover tends to feel like operating some sort of domestic appliance. Uh, Mazda's whole Jinba Itai approach to design champions something different than because you can swap between the six ratios properly with wrist flick changes. There's nothing to get in the way of what the Japanese call toitsukan. That's a word that describes the feeling that you get of greater control, uh, control that's more predictable, uh, more assured, well, more usable. 
the way that this CX-30 sits you a fraction higher than you would be in a Mazda 3 uh, rather helps with the perception of driver commandment. All of which is good because the brand's policy of engine development means that a little more from you is going to be required if you're going to push this car along with any real purpose. And that's because, unlike any of its rivals, this Mazda uses normal aspiration rather than turbocharging for its engines, uh, which prevents you from wafting around on the usual wave of turbo torque. There is less pulling power and you'll find yourself having to change gear a little more often. Now, thanks to that sweet stick shift, uh, we rather like that aspect of the CX-30's character. If you don't, uh, then there is an optional six-speed automatic box available, but it's of the old-school torque converter, slow-witted type, rather than being a modern dual-clutch setup. So, we'd suggest that you try the manual first before deciding. At this point, we should brief you on the fact that only petrol power is on offer here. Uh, two litre Sky Active petrol power in two flavours, both embellished with mild M hybrid 24 volt electrical assistance. Uh, Mazda has decided against providing UK CX30 buyers with the 1.8 litre diesel unit from the Mazda 3 that is fitted to this car and other markets. And we think that decision might cost the brand a few sales here. Obvious rivals like the Volkswagen T Rock and the Ford Puma still find buyers in their black pump fueled forms. Uh, the Japanese maker, though, says there's no real need for diesel because it has something better, a potent Skyactiv X power plant offering all the advantages of petrol power with most of the frugality of a diesel. This 180 PS unit is the more powerful of the two CX-30 engines and it's the one that we've elected to try here because the majority of buyers, up to 70%, will bypass the base 122 PS Skyactiv G unit and choose this instead. The X factor bit here lies in the adoption of what Mazda calls spark controlled compressed ignition or SPCCI. Uh, it's a patented lean burn process that delivers exceptional efficiency. Interestingly, it incorporates a supercharger, not for extra performance, although torque is increased by up to 30% over the Skyactiv G unit, but instead to ensure that there's enough air in the engine for the compression ignition to work properly. It all sounds satisfying sophisticated and sure enough the efficiency stats that we'll cover later in this film if not quite fully diesel like do suggest a running cost advantage which is significant enough to help justify the 1500 pounds extra that you'll have to pay to get the Skyactiv X engine rather than the base unit. On the road, though, you might, like us, be disappointed to find that this simply doesn't feel like an engine with as much as 180 PS at its disposal. Uh, with no turbo to urge things along as you flick from second to third and seek to quickly reach a purposeful level of velocity, uh, the acceleration of this fastest CX-30 can feel distinctly underwhelming. Stick with it, though, and rev the thing out. Uh, peak power is actually developed right up at 6,000 RPM, and proper alacrity is possible, 0 to 62 in 8.5 seconds on the way to 127 miles an hour. Now we can't imagine many owners are actually going to do that though. Uh, those figures are, by the way, for a front-driven CX-30 Skyactiv X model. Uh, with this top engine, there is also the option of the brand's iActive all-wheel drive system, which adds 71 kilos to the curb weight and consequently half a second to the acceleration sprint time figure that just gave you. If this is how a Skyactiv X CX-30 feels, uh, you can imagine a lesser 122 PS Skyactiv G model is going to feel very leisurely indeed. And that's an expectation underlined by our experience with that engine in the Mazda 3 hatch. Uh, with the CX-30 Skyactiv G, 62 takes 10.6 seconds on the way to 116 miles an hour, but that tells little of the real world story. In the base version of this car, you're way down on pulling power over something in this class that's comparably priced, uh, say a VW T-Roc 1.5 litre TSI, and in this case there's no clever SPCCI tech to help out further up the power curve. If you're running late, uh, you need to rev the thing out, and you don't care about the consequential damage to refinement. 
provided you avoid doing that, both of the engines on offer are actually pretty quiet, helped by the rigid body, uh, bespoke carpeting, a specially tuned floor, sophisticated natural sound smoother technology, and what the brand calls natural sound frequency control, which reduces combustion noise. Uh, the end result at easy cruising speeds is brilliantly suppressed wind and road noise, and the kind of hush that you get in a premium badged SUV of this sort. A slightly softer ride than you'll get in the Mazda 3 hatch complements that attitude. Uh, a CX-30 retains the same rather basic torsion beam rear suspension setup as that car, but it deals rather better than its showroom stablemate with poorer tarmac tears and urban obstacles like speed humps. But that does mean that you get a fraction more body roll through faster, tighter bends than you would with a 3. It's not quite enough, uh, returning to the premise that we started with, uh, to stop this car from sharing honours with the Seat Attica and the Ford Puma in this segment as the compact SUV that you could really enjoy driving. Uh, we have talked about the manual gear change, feel some steering, uh, perfect pedal placement and the powerful positive feel of the all disc braking system, they obviously also help here too, as does this car's very tractable nature, aided by its standard G vectoring control plus system. That's essentially a more sophisticated take on the kind of torque vectoring tech that many rival models use to reduce wheel spin when you're powering through corners at speed. Now usually that kind of setup is based only on throttle positioning. Uh, it momentarily reduces the amount of torque being delivered to the front wheels as you enter a bend. Uh, that transfers weight to the front axle which increases front tyre grip and then enables the front wheels to turn more precisely. Now, GVC Plus does this too, but it works in a more accurate, more driver oriented way because it takes into account steering inputs. The combined result of this cleverer approach is a greater keenness to change direction, a reduction in your head and body sway, and a sense of real fluency to the way that this car goes down the road. It'll need to be on a road, of course. Uh, Mazda does talk about this being an SUV, but it's actually more of a crossover, a uh, modified family hatch with off-road cues rather than a car with any rough road capability. Uh, the fact that there's hardly any more ride height than you get in a Mazda 3 hatch would very swiftly bring you to a crunching halt if you attempted any kind of terrain more arduous than a muddy car park or something. And as you'd expect, the optional iActive all-wheel drive system that we mentioned earlier, uh, we're trying that here, has been developed very much for enhancing paved surface traction. It uses the brakes and driveline to gently manipulate the car's weight transfer at the same time uh, associating tyre loading and torque distribution to better propel you through the corners. Uh, you won't feel very much difference in dry conditions, but for better managing damp or slippery ones, uh, you might feel the extra all-wheel drive investment to be worth making. As for the urban jungle that this CX-30 has been primarily designed for, well, you might object to the fact that this Mazda doesn't seat you quite as commandingly as most of its segment rivals, but otherwise this crossover works really well in a town environment. In stop-start street work, some competing models we've found exhibit an annoying fractional delay pulling away from rest when you first touch the throttle pedal, particularly in their automatic forms. Now, thanks to the way that its M hybrid system gives gives you a little electrified boost when you're starting off from standstill, the CX-30 doesn't have that issue. Plus, it's a little easier to see out of than the Mazda 3, and it'll almost certainly have a reversing camera that'll make it easier to park, and it features standard blind spot information tech that you'll come to rely on in crowded commuting conditions. In short, this is the very complete package that Mazda needed it to be. Quirky, maybe, but as we said earlier, with familiarity, you might like it for that. Mazda likes to coin fancy Japanese-derived words and phrases to describe its approach to automotive design, and that would be a touch annoying if the hyperbole didn't amount to much. As it happens, though, the brand is going through something of a purple patch in terms of its styling ingenuity. The fourth generation Mazda 3 hatch is a good looker, and it's evolved here into an SUV that, from some angles, is just as smart. 
Both models borrow their sensual shaping from an updated so-called charge and release version of the brand's modern Kodo design language. This revised approach was first showcased on the company's recent RX Vision and Vision Coupe motor show concept cars. With the CX-30, the idea was to provide a coupe-like upper body with an SUV-style lower silhouette, uh, which isn't especially novel, nor is the extensive black plastic cladding particularly subtle. What is more unusual and pleasing, though, is that unlike almost every other car on the road, there are no crease lines. The finished shape relies for its aesthetic expression almost entirely on the way that the flanks reflect the surrounding environment as light and shade play on the clean surfaces and the sculpted panels. Mazda says that the style was derived from the brushwork used in Japanese calligraphy and developed to integrate the three key factors of that evolved Kodo design theme. Yohaku, which is the beauty of empty space, Sori, which designates curves with poise and balance, and Utsuroi, the play of light and shade. Now, students of automotive design will appreciate all of this most readily in profile, where, for example, the Sori concept is embodied by the arc of the shoulder, which runs from the front wing to the rear wheel here, and Utsuroi can be seen in the body surfaces beneath the shoulder line, uh, which reflect the surroundings in an S shape as the car moves. Interesting, the company's chosen to make the roof line a little lower than it is with obvious rivals. And wheel sizing has been relatively restrained too. Uh, there's a choice of either 16 or 18 inch rims, uh, depending on the trim level that you've chosen. We have the 18 inches here. Uh, as for overall dimensions, well, proof that this is more than just a Mazda 3 on stilts is delivered by an overall length figure, which is 65 millimeters shorter than that car. The CX-30 is 4,000. 1395 millimeter figure it almost exactly mirrors that of the segment leading Nissan Qashqai which for reference makes the CX-30 just 155 mils shorter than the brand CX-5. The front styling subtly evolves the look that we first saw with that fourth generation Mazda 3, which means that, as with that car, the CX-30 features slim LED headlamps with a ring-shaped lighting pattern and a lower section framed by a wing-shaped styling element that flows into this imposing black grille, which, as here, will be finished in gloss black, providing you avoid the two base trim levels. Uh, it is a little more different further down. The uh, contrast coloured bumper is unique to the CX-30, of course, as is this narrow air intake just behind the registration plate. Mazda has tried to be equally creative at the rear, with rear wings that stand proud from the tapered rear cabin and the tailgate with a correspondingly narrowed arch shape. Avoid the two base trim levels and you get these signature LED rear tail lamps with LED indicators. Uh, this subtle roof spoiler provides a finishing touch. As usual though, what is rather more important is what you can't see. Now, the body is bolted to the new generation Sky Active vehicle architecture platform uh, that was first developed for the Mazda 3, uh, over a quarter of which is fashioned from ultra-high tensile steel. It's uh, based on straight framework and continuous ring structures, uh, which make it particularly stiff and crash resistant, hence the class-leading safety credentials that uh, uh, you'll learn about later on in this film. Right, time to take a look in the cabin. Now Mazda reckons that if the styling of this car doesn't sell it to you, there's more than a chance that the look and feel that you get when seated up front will. So let's see. Everything here is as smart, classy and well finished as it is in the Mazda 3. To suit the crossover vibe, you sit slightly higher here than you would in one of those, but the difference is fractional and you're not as commandingly placed as you would be in most rival models. If you can live with that though, there's loads to like here with a snug, condensed cockpit area for the driver and a clean, airy, open space around the passenger. Uh, you get as many buttons as are necessary for the things that you really need, yet it all looks pleasingly uncluttered and rather minimalist. 
It's a premium class cabin, no question. The elegantly slender dashboard is swathed in lovely padded, soft-touched, stitched surfaces that even extend to the lower edges of the centre console. A few key changes differentiate this Certes cabin from that of the Mazda 3. Reshaped squarical vents replace that car's circular items, and the upper area of the dashboard features this secondary wing-shaped hood which runs horizontally from the top of the dials into the door trim on the passenger side. Uh, finished with more high quality stitching and metallic accents, this feature aims to give the cockpit a more expansive feel. And that's also the thinking behind the installation of this particularly wide centre console. That's made possible by the fact that these front two chairs are actually the same distance apart as they are in the brand's larger CX-5 model. Two basic trim packages are offered, dark grey cloth with navy blue interior accents for standard variants and as here, black leather with rich brown interior accents for the two top trim levels. Uh, nor is it just that all this looks good, we're actually struggling to think of an ergonomically superior cabin in a car of this kind, uh, which hasn't been achieved by accident. Uh, the designers went to huge efforts working on the placement of controls so they could be used by the arm at a more relaxed angle, and that's one of the reasons reasons why the manual gear stick here is so satisfying to use. Little touches also help here, like the length of the adjustable armrest. That makes it easier for the driver to operate the rotary command control for the infotainment display. Now, yes, infotainment. This is another area in which Mazda has bucked the current fashion. The large, clear 8.8-inch centre dash monitor that's been fitted here ignores the trend for touchscreen functionality, which the Japanese brand says is distracting for the driver. We agree with that. Once you adjust to the functionality of the command control here, it's much easier to select the audio, phone, informational or navigational features that you want without taking your eyes off the road. And because it doesn't have to be positioned near enough to be touched by the driver, uh, the display can be closer to the windscreen and so it can be more in your line of sight. Uh, talking of interfaces that are in your line of sight, this head-up active driving display is standard across the range. And although there's no option for the kind of full-width instrument binnacle screen which is currently fashionable in this segment, uh, the neat white on black instruments that you view through this really gorgeously crafted steering wheel are a model of clarity. The, the two outer dials are separated by a 7-inch round TFT display uh, with flanking narrow readouts that change with mode selection. Now because this middle speedo gauge is actually a customizable screen, it can be configured to display in different ways, as a conventional dial, as a dial with incorporated trip info, or as a display with digital speed readout and safety assist graphics. As usual, Mazda's Jinba Itai human-centric approach to cabin design makes it pretty easy to find a near-perfect driving position. There's 70 millimeters of telescopic steering adjustment uh, and 40 millimeters of tilt, and front seat cushion tilt adjustment is standard on all models as part of a drive to better support the driver's pelvic and back regions. Uh, unfortunately, though, lumbar support is limited to the top GT variants. As for all-round visibility, well, Mazda says it's taken a lot of care over the thickness and shape of the A-pillar, but even so, front three-quarter vision is only adequate. Uh, Over-the-shoulder view isn't brilliant either, but it is at least better than on the Mazda 3, thanks to a narrower rear C-pillar with extra integrated quarter-light windows. It also helps that rear parking sensors are standard on all variants, as laudably is a blind-spot monitoring system, and if you can avoid entry level trim, you'll get a reversing camera too. Cabin storage space isn't much to write home about. Uh, most of the space in the uncooled glove box is taken up by the owner's manual. Uh, that's a bit pointless because you can display it in digital form on the central infotainment screen. Uh, you do, though, get decently sized door bins with bottle holders. And there is also this rubber-coated non-slip area at the base of the centre stack. Uh, that is probably where you're going to want to put your phone because there is a USB port just above. Uh, next to this, 
is, rather refreshingly, uh, a CD player is provided too. Behind that is a lidded area that covers a couple of cup holders. Uh, the top is finished in piano black trimming, and that also surrounds the gear stick. It's a uh, surfacing that looks smart, but it'll easily smear and scratch. Uh, there's also an overhead compartment for your sunglasses. Uh, there is a compartment down here by the driver's right knee, and there's a ticket clip on the driver's sun visor there. In addition, behind the gear stick, you get a deep, spacious bin between the seats, and that's got a removable a plastic interior panel that can compartmentalize it. It also has USB and 12 volt ports and the stitched sliding top that we referred to earlier. We also like the little touches, uh, the Audi-like knurled air conditioning switches. Uh, the way, for instance, that the wipers constantly alter their operating angle in fine adjustments to ensure that they clean right to the edges of the screen. And the way that the eight-speaker standard audio setup emits lower door-mounted speakers to try to reduce the tinny buzzing at low frequencies that audio systems in family cars typically deliver. Now here we're trying the upgraded 12-speaker Bose package which offers clearer sound quality than some audio systems we've tried in vastly more expensive cars. So it's mostly all good. Uh, where the design proposition of this model's Mazda 3 sister car started to slightly unravel though was when it came to rear seat space. So can this CX30 do better? Well, the Japanese designers have increased the seat hip point height to 619 millimeters, and they've specially sculpted the seat cushion and the B-pillar shaping uh, so as to make this crossover easier to get into. But it's still necessary to duck down and pivot yourself through the slightly narrow opening, and that sometimes might create the odd issue if you habitually have to get things like child seats in and out. Once inside, it's certainly a little more spacious and a touch less gloomy than it is in Mazda 3 hatch, but not much. Uh, several rivals offer more space than this. Headroom is fine, but leg space remains a touch restricted by class standards. Uh, you could certainly live with it, though, particularly if this was merely a second family car. It's lighter back here than it is in the 3, primarily because of the addition of these uh, little rear quarter light windows that sit over your shoulder. Um, we weren't really expecting to find a sliding seat base in this car, although some smaller and cheaper SUVs do offer that feature, but we were a bit surprised that Mazda hasn't thought to include a reclining seat back. This cabin is just about wide enough for three adults to sit alongside each other without feeling like sardines. Uh, if you're not using the middle part of this bench, which is likely given the prominent height of this centre transmission tunnel, uh, then you'll be able to pull down this centre armrest with its twin cup holders. Uh, there are reasonably sized door pockets with bottle holders and providing you avoid entry level trim, uh, you will get the twin central vents which are missing at the back of the Mazda 3. But you don't get any sort of connectivity port and the seat back pocket is only provided on the left hand side which uh, does seem a bit mean. On the plus side, these LED overhead reading lights are smart and the quality ambiance is embellished by smart little touches like this door card stitching. Okay, let's finish with a look at the boot, uh, which, assuming you've avoided base level trim, will be accessed via this powered tailgate. Once it's risen, a 430 litre capacity is revealed. It's 81 litres more than you'll get in a Mazda 3. Well, a Mazda 3 hatch, anyway. The Mazda 3 saloon offers 450 litres. The larger CX-5 SUV has 506 litres. Uh, the trunk space on offer here is 53 litres more than you'll get from a rival Toyota CHR, and it exactly matches what's provided by the class-leading Nissan Qashqai, but that Nissan has one of the smaller boots in the segment. Uh, to give you a more typical idea of what is common in this sector, uh, let's tell you that a Volkswagen T-Roc has 445 litres, a Ford Puma 456, and something like a BMW X1 will give you 505 litres. So this isn't the car to choose in this segment if you prioritise luggage capacity. The boot opening width is a decent 1030 millimeters, but it's not a particularly versatile space, although Mazda claims a global standard baby buggy and a carry-on bag would fit. Uh, there is no adjustable height boot floor, so there is quite a drop 
from the cargo lip, which is 731 millimeters high, to the trunk base. And although there is seven liters more room for small items below the boot floor, uh, you'll lose much of that and the opportunity, of course, to add a spare wheel if you choose a top variant, which will be equipped down here with the subwoofer for the upgraded Bose audio system. There are four tie-down points that are missing in the Mazda 3, but you still don't get bag hooks, and we don't really understand the reason for the provision of these fairly useless straps on the right-hand sidewall. Uh, the seat shoulder catches for the 60-40 split folding rear bench are a little awkward to reach. Uh, there's no useful 40-20-40 split folding seat back like you do get in a BMW X1, for example. And there's no ski hatch option either, so no opportunity to slide long items in between a couple of rear seated occupants. But at least when the cushion uh, does fall, it creates a reasonably large loading area that is 1,406 litres in capacity. That's three. 380 litres bigger than a Mazda 3 hatch. The CX-30 range isn't too difficult to get your head around. Uh, prices sit in the 23 to 35,000 pound bracket, common to better quality models in the family hatch derived part of the mainstream brand compact SUV segment, the Qashqai crossover class. Uh, we wonder though whether it's really necessary to have as many as five different trim levels. SEL, SEL Lux, Sport Lux, uh, the GT Sport variant and this top GT Sport Tech spec. At least your engine choice ought to be fairly straightforward. Uh, a little surprisingly, Mazda declines to offer UK CX-30 buyers the 1.8-litre Skyactiv D diesel from the Mazda 3 that is available on this crossover in other markets. So, both the power plants on offer are normally aspirated 2-litre petrol units, which, uh, as in the 3, benefit from cylinder deactivation and the brand's M-Hybrid mild hybrid system. Now, your most affordable option is the base 122 PS Skyactiv G unit, but this really does feel a bit feeble. So we would counsel you, if at all possible, to try to find the £1,500 extra that the brand wants for the much more sophisticated engine that we've been trying here. Now, this is a power plant that Mazda is rather proud of. It's 180 PS Skyactiv X unit, which uses a clever spark-controlled compression ignition process, which enables it to run much leaner than a normal petrol engine ever could. Hence, the brand's claim that this unit can deliver near diesel levels of efficiency. Well, it certainly improves significantly on the figures that are delivered by the lesser Skyactiv G unit, and that's despite its much greater power output. Uh, the Skyactiv X option is the one that you're going to have to choose if you want to add in all-wheel drive to this car. Uh, that 4x4 option isn't cheap. It pushes up the CX-30's price by over £2,200 and it'll only be available to you if you're able to avoid the two least expensive trim levels. Whatever your engine or drivetrain selection, uh, your dealer will offer you the choice between two 6B transmissions. Uh, now, we would very much recommend the slick-shifting Skyactiv MT manual box that we've been trying in this car or for £1,500 more you can instead have a Skyactiv drive automatic. So what about price positioning? Well we'll start with the way that the CX-30 fits into Mazda's wider product range. Uh, you're looking at needing to find around £1,000 over an equivalently engined and trimmed Mazda 3 hatch which likely SUV buyers in this segment will probably be reasonably happy to pay for this model's greater versatility. Now given that most versions of the brand's larger CX-5 sell at nearly £30,000 or more, there's clearly scope for this SUV to hoover up a lot of sales that the company would otherwise lose in the growing compact crossover class. But what about rivals from other manufacturers? Well, it's easy to talk about popular cars in this class like Nissan's Qashqai and Seat's Attica, and we will in a moment. But the truth is that the CX-30's core market is likely to be amongst buyers looking for slightly trendier cars than that. So here we're thinking of uh, similarly sized and very comparably priced fashionable crossovers like Volkswagen's T-Roc, Ford's Puma, uh, Toyota CHR. 
Audi's Q2 and Jeep's Renegade, perhaps also Honda's HRV. All of those cars are positioned a couple of thousand above what you pay for a slightly more run-of-the-mill Qashqai or Attica, or indeed, say, a Kia Sportage, a Hyundai Tucson, or something slightly less familiar, like a Suzuki SX4 S-Cross, a Sangyong Corando, or a Mitsubishi ASX. But you're getting a lot more of a street-side statement in return, which, increasingly, is what buyers in this sector really want. If you're making crossover comparisons, make sure you're comparing apples with apples, which in this case means that this car is really designed against small SUVs based on the underpinnings of Focus or Golf-sized family hatchbacks rather than Fiesta or Polo-sized Superminis. Uh, plusher versions of Supermini-derived SUVs, so cars like the Nissan Juke, uh, Renault's Capture, Skoda's Kamiq, uh, Seat's Arona and Volkswagen's T-Cross could easily cost you CX-30 money, but they'll be significantly smaller inside with less boot space and lower capacity engines, and those will be less suitable for longer journeys. Of course, there are plenty of Qashqai class contenders similar in size to this Mazda that we haven't so far mentioned, but we haven't yet referenced them because in the main they tend to be more closely priced to Mazda's larger CX-5 model. So here we're thinking of SUVs like Ford's Cougar, uh, Skoda's Karoq, Volkswagen's Tiguan, Citroen's C5 Aircross, Jeep's Compass, Mini's Countryman, Renault's Kajar, Vauxhall's Grandland X and Peugeot's 3008. Now we can't leave the area of comparative model comparison without referencing Mazda's wish that this car might also steal sales from similarly sized premium badged SUV models in this segment. So cars like BMW's X1, Audi's Q3, uh, the Mercedes GLA, Volvo's XC40, Jaguar's E-Pace and the Lexus UX. In theory, these posh small crossovers can be priced from under £30,000. In practice, almost all of them are sold at well over that figure, which makes the price gap to a comparable CX-30 quite considerable, even if you happen to be looking at quite a plush version of this Mazda. Now, given the premium finishing of this car's cabin, that leaves this Japanese contender really quite handily placed, we think. If you agree and you find the CX-30 taking your interest, then you're going to be interested to know just how generous Mazda has been with the standard spec. So, time for the detail on that. Uh, even with base SEL trim, you can expect to find 16-inch grey metallic alloy wheels, full LED headlights with high beam control, LED rear lamps, uh, rear parking sensors, heated mirrors, auto headlamps and wipers, and a Thatcham Category 1 alarm. Interior features include elements that you'd normally have to pay extra for at the bottom of the range on a car of this kind. So we're talking about things like a head-up display, power folding functionality for the door mirrors, and for the driver's seat cushion tilt adjustment. Uh, more expected inclusions, they run to air conditioning and also leather for the steering wheel and for the gear knob. Uh, that's along with a trip computer. As for driver stuff, well, there's a G Vectoring Control Plus system, which helps to maximize traction through the corners. And all models get the Mazda Radar Cruise Control Package, which uses a millimeter radar and a forward-facing camera to automatically regulate your highway speed to vehicles ahead. Plus, if you come across a tailback and you have opted for an automatic CX-30 model, then this setup can automatically slow you down to a standstill, and then it will start you off again. Uh, in Intelligent Speed Assist is also built into that system and that's a setup that works with standard traffic sign recognition and that allows the car to uh, recognize the speed limit signs that you pass. Because of this, once you've set a speed into the limiter, you won't be able to unintentionally exceed it, which ought to prevent future speeding tickets. Well, in theory anyway. Infotainment across the CX-30 range is taken care of by a Mazda multimedia system using a centre dash 8.8 inch colour infotainment screen which is linked to voice activation and to the kind of separate multimedia commander control dial that you'd normally need a premium brand model to get in this segment. Uh, the display incorporates an integrated navigation system. Uh, this one includes five years of free European map updates and a 3D gyro sensor that calculates the car's position even when there's no GPS signal. Uh, the setup will give you dynamic routing and that will divert you around jams based on real-time traffic information as well as information on speed camera locations, uh, weather forecasts and road conditions 
Plus, there's a search and go system which will direct you to places of interest at any given location, anywhere from a restaurant to a railway station. The monitor additionally delivers the usual Bluetooth and internet app integration elements, plus there's a high-quality 8-speaker DAB audio system. Also, you get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Should you go further up the range? Well, beyond base SEL spec, the next step up is a lightly embellished SEL Lux trim level, which adds in smart keyless entry, dual zone climate control, and that gets you rear vents, a reversing camera, a powered tailgate, and front parking sensors, plus an auto dimming feature for the rear view mirror and for the door mirrors. Uh, there's also a CD player, and that's an oft forgotten feature on modern cars these days. Uh, Mid range Sport Lux trim, that elevates you to the more upmarket look that features further up the range, and that's courtesy of larger 18-inch alloy wheels, a black gloss finished front grille, signature LED rear combination lights, and rear privacy glass. Plus, there's a black gloss finish for the B and the C pillars. A Sport Lux spec also gets you a frameless rear view mirror, and if you specify an auto gearbox, paddle shift controls behind the steering wheel. Skyactiv X engine Sport Lux models get a powered sunroof and a smarter silver metallic wheel finish too. Ideally though, you'd probably want to stretch to one of the two top spec variants, GT Sport and GT Sport Tech, the latter, as I previously mentioned, being what we have here. Now as well as all the features uh, already mentioned, GT Sport spec gets you black leather upholstery, a driver's seat with heating, power adjustment and lumbar support, plus a heated steering wheel and a 12-speaker Bose surround sound audio system. Uh, GT Sport Tech adds to that with a 360-degree monitor, front, rear and side camera setup and some extra camera-driven safety features that we'll come on to in just a moment. On to options. Now, whatever variant you decide on, you'll almost certainly be paying your Mazda dealer extra for your choice of paint color because the only one that comes as standard is the only solid shade, and that's Arctic White. Uh, beyond that, there's a selection of pearlescent, metallic, and mica shades. Uh, we have polymetal gray here. That's a metallic finish which combines bright aluminum flakes and opaque pigment and offers tonality that changes with the light. Our absolute favourite panel shade, though, is the top one, and that's Mazda's specially developed signature Soul Red metallic paint, which features embedded tiny flakes of reflective pigment. It looks absolutely gorgeous. What else? Um, well, you can upgrade to the larger 18-inch wheels if the trim grade that you've chosen doesn't include those. Uh, you might also want to add illuminated scuff plates, mud flaps, or a wireless phone charger. Now, if you've opted for one of the GT Sport grades, you can change the color of the leather upholstery to stone gray. What about a few practical touches? Well, you can add in mud flaps, a door entry protection foil, all weather floor mats, and for the boot, a rear bumper step foil and trunk liner. You can add in a roof rack, of course, as well as a roof box, ski and snowboard attachments, and a pro bicycle roof bar attachment. A tow bar is available, of course, and to it, you can add a two bike carrier. Enough with extras, uh, we'll finish as usual with a look at safety provision. Now Mazda is keen for us to tell you about that, and with good reason, because when it was tested by Euro NCAP, the CX-30 recorded a record 99% score in terms of adult occupant protection. It also achieved maximum scores in Euro NCAP's full width barrier, side impact and side pole tests. Uh, the latter simulates the car running off the road and hitting a tree. Now Matthew Avery, from uh, Thatcham Research, who conducts Euro NCAP tests in the UK, uh, described the CX-30 score as truly impressive, asserting that in the event of an accident, there are few safer places to be than the front seats of the Mazda CX-30. Now, this car also scored highly in Euro NCAP's various other safety tests. It recorded 86% for child occupant protection, 80% for vulnerable road users, and 77% for safety assist features. Thatcham cited the rigid platform of this SUV as being key to this impressive showing, all of it built on a tough Skyactiv vehicle architecture platform fabricated with multi-directional ring structures and a significant amount of ultra-high tensile steel. 
The result is around double the level of energy absorption and an impact that a car of this kind would have offered you a decade ago. Uh, cabin deformation being minimised in a side impact by dispersing energy from multiple directions to the front and rear of the vehicle. Uh, the designers have also carefully considered the seat, airbag and seat belt designs to improve passive safety. Uh, for example, the neck injury mitigating front seats are particularly effective in the way that they can minimise accident whiplash. Otherwise, it's pretty much as you'd expect, in addition to Isofix charge seat fastenings and the pedestrian-friendly design for the front bonnet and bumper, there are the expected twin front side and curtain airbags, as well as a driver's knee bag. Uh, there is also tyre pressure monitoring, hill start assist, and the usual electronic assistance for traction and stability control. Uh, the anti-lock brakes include a brake assist system for emergency stops, and that's advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard flashing lights. Uh, in addition, there is speed limit sign alert, traffic sign recognition, which uh, pictures road signs as you pass them and then displays them for you on the dash. And there's a pedal misuse alert system that alerts the driver when the accelerator and the brake pedals are depressed simultaneously. These days, though, buyers in this segment expect all that to be embellished by the kind of really sophisticated camera-driven features that Mazda provides, courtesy of its advanced eye active sense technology. Now, as you'd want in this day and age, autonomous braking uh, has been standardized across the range. Now, the Mazda brand calls its system SCBS, or Smart City Brake Support. As with other such setups, this one scans the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards as you drive at speeds of up to 50 miles an hour with particular emphasis on identifying errant pedestrians. Now, if a person or an object that you might be imminently about to hit is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or perhaps you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Now, via a distance recognition support system, which is accessible through the Centre Dash infotainment screen, you can vary the SCBS setup sensitivity via far, medium or near settings. Uh, overall, the Mazda SCBS approach to autonomous braking uh, generally works well, although sometimes it is prone to flash up urgent brake warnings on the head-up display a little more readily than it should. We really like the way that the package is backed up by a secondary collision reduction feature which keeps the anchors on in the event of an accident to stop the car hitting anything else. There's more too because all CX-30 variants also get a further suite of clever camera safety features. Now earlier we mentioned the Mazda radar cruise control system which automatically keeps you a safe distance behind the car in front on the highway and on an auto model it can, if necessary, even remotely slow you right down to a stop and then start you off again if you come across a traffic tailback. Uh, we also referenced high beam control. Now that automatically dips your headlights for you at night and earlier we mentioned traffic sign recognition now that is a system that pictures speed signs for you as you pass them and then displays them on the dash uh, additionally there is lane keep assist now that works at speeds of over 38 miles an hour to alert you if you drift out of your lane on the highway before gently steering you back to where you ought to be. Uh, advanced blind spot monitoring, that's a system that works at over 19 miles an hour to stop you from pulling out to overtake if there's a vehicle in your blind spot. And rear cross traffic alert, that will warn you of oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a parking space. There is also driver attention alert and that continually monitors your driving reactions and looks for drowsiness. Avoid the base SEL grades and you also get the LED headlights and they have adaptive functionality and a longer 200 meter range. Here the headlamps distribute light from the high beams in three different patterns depending on the car's speed and feature six stage directional control linked to the steering angle. 
If you want more safety kit, you'll have to stretch to the very top of the range. This top GT Sport Tech variant includes five further camera-driven features. There's FCTA, or Front Cross Traffic Alert, that alerts you to crossing traffic at junctions. And at this top level in the range, you get two clever smart brake support features. One is SBSR, Smart City Brake Support Rear. Now that anticipates an impending rear-end impact and minimizes its effects. And the other is SBSR. SBSRC or Smart Brake Support Rear Crossing. Now that helps to prevent low speed collisions when you're uh, reversing out of a space. Uh, there is also DM, which is driver monitoring. Now that's basically an even more sophisticated version of the driver attention alert setup that we mentioned earlier. Uh, the DM system uses a camera and infrared LED monitor to oversee the driver's condition both day and night, even if the driver happens to be wearing sunglasses. And finally, there's Mazda's contribution to the current trend towards semi-autonomous driving, CTS, or Cruising and Traffic Support. CTS automatically operates the accelerator and the brake pedals to maintain a proper trailing distance between the car and the vehicle ahead, which is great not only at cruising speeds, but also when you're stuck in a traffic jam. And in addition, it assists with steering operations to keep you in lane, although you have to keep your hands on the wheel at all times. If you're looking at choosing an SUV crossover like this over a conventional family hatch, uh, then you won't want to be saddled with a significant running cost premium for doing that. So if you're attracted by this Mazda, you'll be very pleased to find that it makes a better job than many of its rivals in minimizing the adverse fuel economy and the higher emission downsides that tend to come with the added weight of the higher riding crossover genre. In this case, that bulk has been pegged at around 45 kilos over the equivalent Mazda 3 hatch, which isn't bad, although we can't help thinking that overall curb weight is something that the Japanese brand needs to have a bit of a rethink about. On the scales, the CX-30 doesn't come in at much less than one and a half tons, and that's quite a lot for the size it is. Uh, originally, the company's much trumpeted Skyactiv technology was all about creating class-leadingly light cars. Today, though, we have have here a new Mazda model that is 100 to 150 kilos heavier than Qashqai and Attica rivals that have been on the market for ages. This reflects the fact that in recent years, the Hiroshima brand's attention has instead been concentrated more on efficient underbonnet engineering. Uh, turbocharging, the company says, isn't a good route to high efficiency, uh, nor is diesel power, but mild hybrid tech is, hence the introduction of M-Hybrid light electrification on the pair of two-liter Skyactiv petrol engines uh, that customers can choose from with this SUV. This 24 volt mild hybrid system improves fuel economy by recycling recovered kinetic energy. A belt driven integrated starter generator stores the energy recovered under deceleration in a 600 kilojoule lithium ion battery, while a DC DC converter supplies it to the car's electrical equipment features. Uh, building further on this, Skyactiv Tech means that mechanical friction has been reduced. That's thanks to an upgraded piston skirt and an optimized oil ring profile and there's a coolant control system for thermal management that promotes quick engine warm-up to reduce fuel consumption. Uh, more significantly there is cylinder deactivation and that shuts down cylinders 1 and 4 in light load situations such as when you're cruising at a constant speed. In the base uh, 122 PS Skyactiv G unit, the result of all that technological effort is a set of fuel economy and emissions figures that are virtually the same as you get in an equivalently powered Mazda 3 hatch. Uh, a manual CX-30 Skyactiv G variant returns up to 45.6 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 116 grams per kilometer of CO2. That's certainly a lot better than you expect normally from a two liter petrol engine. But unfortunately for Mazda, those readings aren't particularly particularly special by the standards that are being achieved by comparable petrol engines producing around 120 PS in the compact SUV segment. 
To take just one example, uh, Ford Puma 125 PS will deliver 52.3 mpg and a Volkswagen T-Roc in 1.5 litre TSI 150 PS form will almost exactly replicate a CX-30 Skyactiv G model's figures at the same time as delivering considerably more power. But hold on, Mazda hasn't finished yet. What if a really clever engineering breakthrough could be added into this two litre power plant to not only take it ahead of the competition, uh, but even make it cleaner and just as CO2 efficient and frugal as an equivalent diesel? Well, every brand in the sector would like to be able to offer such a thing. Mazda claims it can, and that's courtesy of the groundbreaking SPCCI spark controlled compression ignition system used in its top Skyactive X petrol unit, and that's what we've been trying here. SPCCI technology comes out of Mazda's belief, and that's shared in many circles, that electric powertrains don't actually satisfy the society's current wish for a drastic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, take electricity production into account, and your average electric car doesn't actually deliver zero emissions at all. Two thirds of global electricity production is uh, generated by the use of fossil fuels, for goodness sake. As a result, your average electric vehicle's well-to-wheel CO2 reading, uh, the figure that takes everything into account, can often be very close to that of a conventional petrol or diesel fuel model. Uh, it does depend on the energy mix that the electricity is made from. Mazda hasn't uh, abandoned EV development as a result, but it has decided to buck the current technological trend and put significant investment into seeing just how much more efficient a conventional petrol engine can be. A lot more efficient, as it turns out. The Skyactiv X engine is based on the 2 litre normally aspirated mild hybrid Skyactiv G unit, but it can run far leaner than any ordinary petrol power plant ever could. It improves efficiency by up to 30% over the Skyactiv G, and that's helped by a supercharger which ensures there's enough air for the clever spark controlled compression ignition system to function. The result is a set of fuel and CO2 stats that the brand reckons would better those of its conventional 1.8 litre turbo charged Skyactiv-D diesel in regular use, uh, which is why that diesel unit isn't offered to CX-30 buyers in the UK. To be specific, a front-driven manual CX-30 Skyactiv-X manages 47.9 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle and 105 grams per kilometre of any DC rated CO2. Those figures suggest that Mazda's got pretty close to its petrol power with diesel economy goal. Uh, yes, a good diesel in this segment would give you just over 50 mpg, but no black pump fuel model, and in fact no comparable SUV of any kind, can get really near a CX-30 Skyactive X model's impressively low CO2. Of course, sophisticated engineering is all very well, but the main contributing factor to ultimate running cost returns is the way that you drive. And to help you focus on that, Mazda provides a fuel efficiency monitor in the information section of the Mazda multimedia system, uh, the center dash screen here, which gives you an energy flow monitor, and that shows the real-time operation of the M hybrid system and the current status of the cylinder deactivation and the I-stop engine stop starts system. If you keep an eye on all that, uh, you can really make the most of the fact that in our experience, official fuel and CO2 figures of Mazda cars tend to be closer to actual reality than most other brands. On to the other things you'll need to consider when it comes to running cost returns. Uh, your Mazda CX-30 requires a service every 12 months or every 12,500 miles, whichever comes around first. Uh, you will be off the option of a fixed price maintenance plan, and that covers all scheduled servicing uh, with parts and labor for three years or 37,500 miles. Uh, this costs around £650 on a Skyactiv G model or around 800 with a Skyactiv X variant. Owners can keep up to date with their car's maintenance schedule via the vehicle status section of the Mazda multimedia system screen or via a useful My Mazda app which can give you reminders about servicing and through which you can book your car in at a local dealership and access a digitally stored record of your model's service history. 
What else? Uh, residual values. Well, this Mazda does relatively well here. Independent experts reckon that a front-driven Mazda CX-30 Skyactive X variant with GT Sport trim will still be worth 48% of its original value after three years and 30,000 miles of use, which is very class competitive. As a result, leasing costs for this car are also pretty competitive, even when compared to some cars in this segment that feature a lower sticker price. Now we should additionally mention the warranty, uh, that is the usual unremarkable three year 60,000 mile package. If you want to extend that, then you can do so via the optional essential elite and complete plans included in the standard package as a three year paintwork warranty and 12 years of anti-perforation cover. In addition, there's a Mazda accident aftercare scheme which sees the company liaise with your insurer after an accident, uh, making sure that you have access to a courtesy car if you need one and ensuring that all repairs are carried out to full Mazda standards. VED taxation is still based on CO2 figures collated under the old NEDC test, uh, which means that based on the readings that we quoted earlier, you can expect to pay £145 in the first year of ownership for all models. Uh, Front-driven manual Skyactive X CX30 models fall into VED band F. For all other variants, it's band G. Uh, finally, let's tell you about insurance. If you opt for the Skyactive G petrol model in SEL or Sport Lux trim, you'll pay a premium base based on a Group 16E rating, uh, one group higher than an equivalent Mazda 3 hatch. It's 17E if you have the engine with one of the GT Sport specs. For the Skyactive X engine, you're looking at Group 22E, unless you opt for this top GT Sport Tech model, which is Group 23E. Uh, that's an ironic increase, given that this top spec level gives you a much increased range of camera safety equipment aimed at preventing an accident. Uh, sometimes you really do wonder what planet the insurance companies live on. Anyway, what it all boils down to is that, uh, at least to some extent, this is a car that you can buy with your head as well as your heart. Mazda reckons that this might become its best-selling model, and if that happens, then the CX-30 would have achieved that position on merit. If, like us, you admire the looks, the handling and the cabin quality of the Mazda 3 hatch, but you need a little more rear seat and luggage space, then this is your car. Job done. But can it really be as simple as that in a segment that's now crammed with fashionable alternatives? Well, many of these have even more interior and boot space and most use turbocharged engines that you'll probably find to be rather more flexible than their CX-30's normally aspirated units in day-to-day -day motoring. Thanks, though, to uh, the sweet shifting manual gearbox that you'll probably want in this car, it's really no hardship to access the Skyactive power plant's pulling power in this Mazda. You might even rather enjoy doing so. Are there other issues? Not many. We think the brand should have offered the diesel engine option here that is available in other markets. Plenty of segment customers still want that. And the otherwise admirable Skyactiv X top petrol engine really doesn't feel quite as quick as its output suggests it should be. Apart from that, though, there's an awful lot to like here if you dig the look so you can afford one of the better specified variants. Uh, the cabin quality shames several premium badged models in this segment that we can think of, and the uh, standard equipment levels that Mazda is offering here definitely does. But will the lack of a premium badge ultimately hold this car back? Well, its close rival, Toyota CHR, has already proved that that needn't be an impediment. As with any SUV of this sort, you're paying a premium for the looks and for a bit of extra space, but the CX-30 feels worthy of it. We think it absolutely has to be on your shortlist amongst crossovers of this kind.